on board today. We obviously got Sean and John G. Sutton. How are you, Sean? Yeah, great. John here. It was only coming to my radar in the last year. And his stories about being in the prison service for over a decade, just absolutely mind-blowing. But it wasn't the prisoners he needed to be worried about in the end. It was the bloody staff. He was violently assaulted by them. They set him up to be attacked and possibly killed. So well, his story... Let's, it's, hear that, let's hear that out of his mouth, Sean. Do you want to introduce yourself, John? How are you, mate? Yeah, well, thank you very much for inviting me, Darren. Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. It's a pleasure, mate. I'm very intrigued about your, your story you've got. Would you be in... Uh, uh, you've been quite a few things. Military, ex-prison officer, champion boxer... So let's let's start, if you don't mind me asking, John. Your age, how old are you? I'm 73. Just What's a young lad. So you've seen a lot in your life? <laughs> a lot, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It amazes me at times. <laughs> so you started, you told me before you're from the Lancashire area. We don't really need to know the ex ex exact spot, but give us an insight into your early years, like... So you, how old, what year was it when you was 18 years old? What year would we be in? When I was 18, it would be 1967. Bloody hell, 1967, I weren't even born then, mate. Yeah, 1967, I worked for a long time in the, well, I say a long time, for years, in the in the mills, in the factories in the, in Lancashire, when they had cotton mills, and I was actually a weaver for about two years, and then I went on to be a spinner in a big spinning mill, and I worked nights in the spinning mill. And uh, my parents were extremely strict. My father was a detective inspector in the CID, and uh, my dad's idea of controlling children include making his own version of a cat of nine tails, believe it or not, which he used to whip you with. <laughs> he was a good guy, but I mean, that was his idea of uh, of controlling children. You know, I thought it was madness myself. So, my, my father had the same sort of idea, but he used a belt. <laughs> it must have been a generational thing. I think it was. I think it was like uh, the end of the Victorian era, you know, and uh, he would, his father would be a, an Edwardian Victorian type of guy who was a, a great big FD guy. They're all big fellas, you know. But they, they thought it was right to beat the shit out of you, <laughs> which to so me went, is crazy. So you went from weaving in in a cotton mill into spinning in a cotton mill. Yeah. Did he continue in that area or did he go somewhere? No, you see, the problem was I was working in the mills and at the time it was uh, considered the practice that you brought your wage home and you handed it over to your parents. I was earning a man's wage at the age of 18 and handing it over to my parents and getting what they called spending money. So I thought, bollocks to this, I'm going to join the army. So I went to join the army, and of course I got all the papers for the army, passed the entrance exam, whatever it was, going to send me to the Royal Artillery. And uh, I took the papers, but I had to get it signed by my parents, you see, because I was at the age of uh, majority at that time, was 21. And I was 18, so I took the papers back to my parents and said, you know, I'm going to join the army, but you need to sign the papers. They refused to sign. So I went back to the army in Manchester. It was Fountain Street in Manchester, the recruitment area. I said, my parents won't sign. So I said, I can't, I can't join the army, you know, unless my parents sign. They said, no, what you can do is apply to the magistrates to be made a ward of state. So they took me before the magistrates at the magistrates' court, and I went before them and applied to be made a ward of state, and they made me a ward of state, and uh, they signed my papers to join the military. So I went back and said, uh, I don't need you to sign, I'm good. How old was you then when you finally got into the military? 18. 18. Did you, did you go to any conflicts? Yeah, I was in uh, Libya in 1969, yeah. We're stuck in the middle of the bloody desert there, right in the middle of the Sahara Desert. No joke. If you want to know where flies are made, that's it. There's <laughs> billions of them. Yeah? Seriously. How, how long was you? How long was you in the forces then, John? Five years. 
I would have stayed longer, but my father became seriously ill and uh, it, it, my mother needed help. So I purchased my discharge after five years. Can you, oh, have, can you, can you go a bit further on a ward of state? What, what does that mean exactly? It means that you, they're no longer subjected to parental uh, control, that you are, you are made, uh, the parents are effectively the state, the government becomes your official uh, control, you know, and you can then do what the, what the government says. So I was permitted to join the military and my bloody parents went mad, I tell you. So you were in there uh, from 18 to 23, the illness of your father made you leave the army. How easy was it to leave at the, in then times? Well, you had to purchase your discharge. I mean, in the in today's terms, it would be a couple of thousand pounds, I suppose. It was a few hundred pounds in those days, but uh, I purchased my discharge and then uh, moved back into the area where my mother lived and uh, assisted her with the... Uh, setting up home again because obviously she was still a relatively young woman she was only 44 but she had to start her life all over again you know so i assisted in that for a couple of years uh, until she eventually uh, emigrated to canada and uh, i was off doing my own thing so your father passed away at that time then he did he died of leukemia at the age of 44 which was tragic he was a great big chap you know 16 stone six foot one and uh, when he died, he was about seven stone. There was not much left. Bloody hell. So what, uh, in, in terms of career, what did you turn to from from that? Oh, when I came out of the army, I mean, my dad was uh, still alive and he introduced me to uh, a, a businessman who ran a chain of stores throughout England and uh, I became the head of security for the stores. And I went round the stores... Uh, arresting all the corrupt managers who were stealing <laughs> off him. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Sean so, so mentioned before you, you was a boxer. What, what, year, what, year did, what year did you start boxing? Was that in the military or after? No, in the military, yeah. Around about 1969, 69 to 71. And when I got married in 1970, my wife came to watch me boxing for the, one of the BAOR, the British Army of the Rhine titles, and she said, you're not doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> she hated it. Well, what was what was the gloves like back in them days? Was they like they are now? You know, like 12 ounces, 9 ounces? Did, what you get? What, what were the gloves like back then? Or was you even wearing gloves? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah you wore gloves, all right. I mean, the man, one of my trainers was a guy called Gil Neal, and Gil Neal trained the uh, Olympic boxing team. In fact, Gil Neal said, he said, I, he said, you're going to go a long way with this, you know, and I was knocking them all out. He said, but really, he said, your style isn't suited for amateur boxing. I just used to walk in and do the Mike Tyson stuff. And uh, he said, you really should go professional. So I, when I told my wife that, she went absolutely spare, you know, you're not doing that. <laughs> So I, I did, did your boxing career end when your military career ended? No, no, no. no. After, after that, I won the regimental titles and the area divisional titles and all that. Uh, and then when I got married, my wife insisted that I stop, which um, I took notice of because obviously it, it, it isn't the right way to go. I mean, as you can see, I've got one of them noses that look like it's been battered a bit, you know. <laughs> But look, has, believe me, <laughs> what you've been through, mate. You 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 went to Libya in conflict. You've been in the military. You know you've you've been a head security in a in a chain of businesses up and down the country, I suppose. Then what you you was a prison officer, wasn't you? That's that's what I'm intrigued to hear about you, your time as a prison officer. Yeah. What, what year did you part, um, enroll in to become a prison officer? Well, in 1974, I mean, I'd tidied up all these stores. I'd sorted out all the corrupt managers and had a few of them locked up. I used to do test purchases, you know, go in there, pretend to be Joe Soap, you know, and say, listen, I don't want a receipt. I'll give you 50 quid. I want this, that and the other. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, when I went back in and searched the tills as the head of security, the money would be in the purse or in the back pocket. So... It's strange, isn't it? I mean, you get paid to do your job and you decide you're going to steal from your boss. I've never been able to do that. 
never been able to see myself as stealing from somebody, but each to their own, you know. So anyway, when I'd finished that, I decided I had to do something proper. I'm colorblind. I, I applied to join the police, passed the exams, went for the medical, and uh, they said, you can't come in, you're colorblind. I can't see reds and greens and all the rest of the colours are very faint, you know. So they said it, it's a stipulation that you are able to see colours. Well, you can imagine, can't you? I was proceeding down Deansgate, Manchester, and a green, red, blue, green, <laughs> you know. So they wouldn't take me in. So I thought, I've got to do something. So I thought, well, I'll try the fire brigade. So I went to the fire brigade, same script, passed the exams, medical, failed the, uh, can't pass because you're colourblind. So I tried the prison service, 1974 I applied and uh, went in and I was accepted for the prison service because they didn't test my eyesight, other than to see that I could read, you know. And uh, so I got, I got in the prison service and uh, in January 1975 I started at Strange Ways. Strange Ways, what year was the riots? Was you there for the riots? I wasn't there for the riots, but uh, we get round to that, but I gave evidence for the rioters. Against the crown. Well, that sounds interesting. So, what was it like in the early days in strange ways? Like these days, you've got toilets, you've got wash basins in your cell, you've got all these comfortable things that make your jail a little bit more easier. What was it like in 1974 for prisoners? Uh, the 1974, I mean, it was vastly overcrowded. There was three men to a cell. Uh, the staff were... They seemed to be have, have a mental block on inmates. They treated them like the enemy. Yeah, you know they weren't, they weren't speaking to the inmates. They didn't, as a general rule, they didn't speak to the inmates, and they were extremely aggressive. I would say, you know, do this, just get behind your door. But it was three men to a cell. There was no sanitation. It was bang up, slop out. Plastic buckets full of human waste yeah. carried to a sluice on the landing. And, uh, you know, it was like a converted cell with a, a toilet in there and a big sink. And you poured all your waste down there. And uh, that you did that three times a day. And well, it, continued it continued on like that until the, the early 80s, didn't it? Was well, the, it, only, the only thing that would stop it was the riot. Sorry to over talk. Was it your military background that? influenced you to go into another sort of regimental workplace? It, to a certain extent it was. I mean, I didn't have any problems giving direct orders because I, I was very quickly promoted in the military and I was an NCO. So I was used to giving direct orders. You know, so And that's basically what the prison system was in the early 70s. You know, you, you gave inmates orders and they obeyed them. And if they didn't, then they got snatched. As you probably know. Yeah, I do actually, yeah. So as so let's jump into the eighties then. Go into nineteen eighty one. What was you doing in nineteen eighty one? Was you still in the prison service? Was you still working in a prison? Well, I started I went from Strange Ways to the training school and then from the training school at Lay Hill near Bristol, I went to uh, Wormwood Scrubs. And Wormwood Scrubs is very similar to Strange Ways, except it isn't set out in the Panoptican style. It's set out in each the the four separate wings. Yeah. And I worked on C Wing on, on C2 landing, which was the biggest landing in Europe. It had over 200 inmates on one landing. And uh, there was four staff. And uh, we used to deal with, deal with the, the inmates on there. And from the Scrubs... I went to back to Strange Way because I got in some real lumber at the scrubs with the problems with, the, I believe, that it was the Masons behind it. Well, it certainly was. There was one governor there who was uh, helping himself to the inmates. That's He was unlocking them at lunchtime, taking them down to his office and getting them to bugger him, you know, what that is, sodomize him. Yeah, And uh, I, uh, I reported this. And uh, the chief officer said, on what authority are you investigating senior members of the prison service? And I had a warrant card. What year was this, John? What year was this? 1976, 75, 76. So the, the minute you started raising concerns about the hierarchy within the prison service, the governor's act, what happened to you? Did you start feeling... 
Well, I mean, it out in a circle, if you like. It was very strange, actually. I mean, uh, don't forget, I believed I was doing my job, which, let's be honest, I was doing my job. And uh, they called the police in, and uh, I was on the landing one day, and inmates were coming up to me saying, what the hell have you been doing, Gov? I said, I haven't been doing anything, you know, doing my job, you know. So there's two CID officers down there asking questions about you. They called the police in to investigate me, not the governor. So they were trying to get, I mean, don't forget it's a temptation for any inmate to think, oh, well, I'll get one over on that bastard, you know, but I wasn't on, I wasn't cruel to the prisoners. That don't get you anywhere, does it? Well, so, I think the majority of prisoners can recognise a dirty okay. officer and a clean officer from yeah. a mile away. I think they did, yeah. But it wasn't just the governor. I mean, one of the clergymen, uh, one, one Saturday morning, I went, I saw this man in his uh, prisoner in his cell dressed as a choir boy. So I went into his cell. I said, now, come on, take that. He had a surplus on, you know, and all that. I said, take it off. I said, you're not allowed to have that in your cell here. Why are you wearing it? And he started crying, this lad. I said, well, come on, what are you crying for? Sit down here and tell me what the problem is. So he told me that every Saturday morning, the clergyman came into his cell. He had to get down on his hands and knees and fillet him. That means sucking his tongue. Yeah, let's, let's, let's try and keep it um, reasonable at this time of day. <laughs> but it sounds messy. And um, for people to think that it, it hasn't continued within the prison service, that young men have not been abused within the prison service. I was in Warrington House. It was like a 120 young, young child's prison. And in there, it was dormitories, and it used to be 12 lads to a dorm. And of a night in there, so, some officers would come in and take certain lads out and have the wicked little way with them. And then the lads would come back and just cry all night in the bed. Mm -hmm. And that, that was, that was what, early 90s in Stoke in a place called Warrington House. So for people to think that the, the level of... Um, sexual crime is just outside the gates is, is totally wrong there's a lot of there's a lot of people in power within the prison system that use that power to manipulate individuals that'll do anything to get what they want so especially the ones with addictions well i believe that so, uh, there was a number of members of staff that were involving themselves in the uh, abusing uh, inmates sexually abusing them there was one prison officer who, he must have lost his mind. He barricaded himself into a stock room where they kept all the brooms and all the things. And he had three postal boys in with him. And he sodomized all three of them before we could break the door down. Well, that's messy. And, and all, all this gets brushed under the carpet, doesn't it? It's like they've got a, it's like they've got a cold silence amongst them, haven't they? I've, have you have you ever felt that there's been a code of silence amongst the prison staff and the prison officers? Code of silence, it goes worse than that. I was in charge of the hostel one night that was just outside Wormwood Scrubs and uh, just outside the main entrance to Wormwood Scrubs, a big hostel there. They had about 20, 13 minutes. <coughs> so give me a second, let me take a drink of water. And an inmate came in. And he started to tell me, he was a member of the hostel, you see, tell me about what a wonderful day he had in London and how he'd sent all these people into the back room and tied them up. I thought, this guy's drunk. Well, he was. So I said, I'll oh, sit down, I'll make you a cup of tea. So I made him a cup of tea and uh, I remember it quite well. He had two sugars and he continued to tell me this crazy story. I thought, this guy's out of his head. Anyway, next morning I was going back home and it was a Sunday morning and I picked up a Sunday paper. And uh, in the Sunday paper on the front page, it was armed robbery in the West End. And it was the same story that this guy had told me at 11 o'clock the night before. And it said at the bottom it had a, a, a number to ring for West End Central CID. That's the flying squad, you know, the Sweeney. So I rang the number and told them what I'd heard. And they came to see me and they said, took me to Ealing Police Station, interviewed me again, got a chief inspector out. He interviewed me again, three interviews. And they said, right, we're going to raid the, the hostel at Wormwood Scrubs. And I had to ring the governor and tell him we were coming in. So the governor, who was Norman Honey, 
He said, I don't believe you. So I said, I'll hand you to the chief inspector. So I hand the phone to the chief inspector and uh, he said, right, I'll ring you back. So he rang back. It was about half an hour later. We went in. There was three cars. They're all tooled up, the, the Sweeney. You know, they had all the guns and all that. And Congratulations to our podcast, John Sutton, whose book, HMP Manchester Prison Officer, is now available worldwide. We've done a podcast with John and what he went through with the Freemason prison officers working against him, putting his life on the line is mind boggling. So the subtitle is, I survived terrorist, murderers, rapists and Freemason officer attacks in strange ways and wormwood scrubs, John G. Sutton. So this book includes drugs, riot, shanks, dirty protests, violent Freemason guards, self-mutilation and suicides. Welcome to the brutal truth about life as a prison officer. So with a career spanning 10 years inside of the walls of Britain's most infamous prisons, Manchester Strange Ways and London's Wormwood Scrubs, John Sutton has experienced it all. Attacked by the Soho vampire and insane killer, assaulted by the Cambridge rapist, threatened by the IRA, beaten, persecuted and prosecuted by Freemason officers. John Sutton survived to reveal the heart-hitting truth in this jaw-dropping memoir. From the get-go, he just takes you right inside into a conflict and you just cannot put the book down all the way through. If you've ever wondered what a career in the prison service is really like, then this searingly honest account will take you onto the landings housing Britain's most dangerous prisoners. Accompany John as he carries the keys that lock up murderers, rapists, gangsters, paedophiles, terrorists, addicts, and the mentally ill. As well as the ever-present threat from the inmates, John had to endure a conspiracy of violence from his own colleagues who were Freemasons. Nothing can be more dangerous in prison than the staff not having your back. Horrifying, harrowing and humorous, John's book will take you on an unforgettable journey into a netherworld of drugs, violence and hostile Freemasons. It's even got the Masonic compass symbol on the cover. So check it out, available worldwide. John Sutton's book, HMP Manchester Prison Officer. It's an e-book, paperback and audiobook. Bells ring in and blue lights flashing straight to the scrubs. Went in, got there, and uh, the, the chief officer who was in charge of security standing outside the hostel, and he said to this inspector, he said, uh, I'm very sorry, he said, you won't be able to search the hostel today. He said, because the prison service requires that the inmates be present and there's nobody in the hostel. So the chief inspector said to him, if you don't get out there, but again, way he said, I'll stick you in the back of that van and arrest you for in interfering with the police. And he said to me, Mr. Sutton, will you show us the way in? Well, he'd locked all the doors, so I kicked the doors off. And we went in, and they found what they were looking for, false ID cards and also. And between me making the phone call to Norman Honey and us arriving at the scrubs, it was half an hour. And between that time, every single inmate in the hostel had gone. They all signed themselves out, and it was about half past ten on a Sunday morning. So, so it was cool. obvious that the authorities at the prison had given them the. Oh, yeah. yeah, they were obviously in it. Yeah, they were obviously in it, and and a uh, oh, short while the guy who who had told me all this, he went missing. He he did a runner, but they arrested him about two years later, and uh, the CID phoned me up and said. Uh, is going up to court, is is asked this to be taken into consideration, you know, the armed robbery in the West End. But they said, in the event that he changes his plea, will you come and give evidence? So I didn't have to go, but I agreed that I would. Uh, so I was right about that. I mean, they had been using the hostel at Wormwood Scrubs as a base for armed robberies. How mad is that? Crazy. But it happens, you know... It Everyone seems to think that the people that work in these prison establishments are law-abiding, upholding citizens when they're just as violent and um, corrupted as most of the men they're looking at, aren't they? Well, I, I found that there, there was a great deal of corruption and I think it went right to the very top. Uh, I, I was When I was at the Scrubs, I was dealing with a, a prisoner who I'm sure that you will know called John Stonehouse. 
Now, John Stonehouse was a member of the cabinet, uh, the Labour government, and he was the postmaster general, and he set up a bank, robbed his own bank, faked his own suicide, and uh, took off with all the money, and he was subsequently arrested and uh, found guilty and stuck in Wormwood Scrubs. But he had a, like a minor heart attack, and I was in charge of him at Hammersmith Hospital. Sat next to John Stonehouse, he said to me, Officer, will you go and get me my glucosid and a copy of The Times? I said to John Stonehouse, I said, I think you made a little mistake here, you know. You prisoner, me prison officer. You stay in your bed and I'll stay here and make sure you don't escape. So you would think, you know, that's fairly a fair explanation, isn't it? Yeah, that's fair. He didn't, he, he, he rang this bell and this ward sister came over and she said, Officer, will you go and get him his Lucas aid? And this, I said, uh, you're interfering with a home office production here. I said, and if you don't get about your nursing duties, I will arrest you. What do you think happened? She phoned the governor at uh, Wormwood Scrubs and I was replaced. <laughs> yeah. They it's, it's sent for a butler. <laughs> and did he escape? Did he bollocks? He wouldn't escape from me, I tell you. But when I got back to, when I got back to Wormwood Scrubs, the chief officer sent for me. He said, what's all this about Hammersmith? I said, did he escape? He said, no, he didn't. I said, well, that's what I was there for, to make sure he didn't escape. If you'd wanted a butler, you should have got somebody else. Get out of my office, you know. They're bloody soft bastards. I mean, what did they think the job was? What about, John? What about the, the posh voice sounding guy that was the motor car, motor car driver? Oh, that guy, yeah. Go on, your microphone's dead loud. Oh, is it? I'll turn it down. Is my microphone too loud? No, yours is fine, mate. All right, yeah, okay. Right, I was in charge of all new receptions on Sea Wing at, at the Scrubs, and uh, we had about eight new receptions one day. Now, it was my job to allocate them cells, take them to the cells, put them in the cells, cell card in, and get them added to the uh, landing register, which I did one at a time. And there was a guy who was in, in the queue, because they all had to stand there, wait for me one at a time while I did this. And it's no easy task because it was absolutely packed, the, the, the sea wing at the scrubs. And this guy says to me, he said, the officer, he said, I've been standing here for over an hour and a half. He said, and you are not doing this very efficiently, are you? I said, uh, I, I was surprised to hear this, you know. So I said, I'm very sorry, you know. I said, but if you'd like to make a formal complaint about my behavior said there is an office there right in front of you the guy in the window you go and tell him that you're not satisfied i said i'm sure he'll listen to you i knew what this guy was he was absolutely bloody mad this senior officer who was in charge he'd been an ex-professional wrestler and he, he would have tattled anybody so this guy went up and made a formal complaint about me and this guy behind the he pretended to be angry he said mr sutton come here I went over, I said, uh, yes. He said, put him in cell two, C123. I said, are you, are you sure about this? He said, I'm telling you, do it. And this guy looks at me as if to say, that's how you get things done in here. Little did he know he was going in with the tramps, the paraffin lamps. And these are doubly incontinent people who have been taken off the streets of London and they were slung in these filthy cells on the end of C1 landing and he was going in there with them. He lasted about an hour and he was banging on the door, screaming and shouting. When we opened the door, he came running out, threw himself on the floor and collapsed. They had to, they had to, they had to get the hospital staff to take him away. He was in a padded cell. <laughs> what, 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 what year did you leave the prison? Being a prisoner, oh. when did you come out of that job? Uh, 1985, I was uh, assaulted by other members of staff. See, I didn't just go into the prison. I thought it was a career, you know. Mistakenly, I believed I was joining a disciplined service, a bit like the military, you know. Yeah. Where if, if, if you complied and you passed the exams and you did all this. I passed the exams, you know, the, uh, the principal officer's exam, passed all that. Uh, but, I mean, I might, as, I might as well have written it on a blackboard outside of a village, a waste of time. When you, say, when you say you got assaulted, what do you mean? What do you mean by you got assaulted? Grabbed by the staff and beaten up. What for? What, how come they done this to you? 
Well, it's a long story, but I, I, it really starts with uh, I, I lived in the quarters at Wormwood Scrubs. That was a carry on. You see, when I went to the scrubs, I went to see the uh, housing unit, you know, the people who, because they provided you with houses then called yeah. quarters. I went to see them and they said, oh, no, he said, you've only just joined the scrubs, you know, uh, it'll take 18 months before you get a house. So I thought, well, well, seems unreasonable to me, but I'll go and rent somewhere. So I went to see a local estate agent, and I said, uh, I want to rent like a one-bedroom flat so I can get my wife up. She was in Manchester, you see. And uh, he said, well, where do you work? I said, I'm at the Scrubs. He said, you won't have enough money to do that. My entire wage at the Wormwood Scrubs would not pay for the rent on a one-bedroom flat in London. Wouldn't. So I couldn't bring my wife up. So I went yeah. back to see the, I went back to see the housing department at the scrubs said there's no way i can rent a place so i need a house you know oh well there's none available so i did some research and found out that they got about 20 empty quarters 20 empty houses and i went to see him again i said look you've got 20 empty houses what's all this about oh well they said that we're holding them for senior officers that come in i said right i'll sort this out so i went to see all the staff who were waiting to get quarters like me junior staff and I put, a, I put a petition into the governor, put my name on the top and went to see the governor. I said, there you are, there's a petition. I said, you've got to release the houses. You can't hold them back. I said, we're, we're, the, we're the staff here. We insist that you do it and you're in charge of the housing. He said, well, I've appointed the housing committee. I said, you can appoint who you want. You're in charge here. I said, if I don't get a quota next time at the front of your prison with all these staff, I will be with banners and the press. Now, and I thought the chief officer nearly grabbed hold of me. I, whoosh, I was out of the office. But believe me, next time it came through allocating, I got a quarter. And all the other staff were saying, how did you get a quarter? I said, all you've got to do is get a list, put your name at the top and tell the governor that you're going to demonstrate at the front of his prison if you don't get a quarter. I said, you'll get one then. <laughs> Let me just think of left there a minute, John. Let me say something to the viewers that are on here. Everyone that's on here now, it's nice to have you on board. I haven't been ignoring you, so I've just been intrigued with what's coming out of John G. Sutton's mouth. It's a very intriguing story. I'm sure you agree with me. I'm going to start delving a little bit deeper. He's got a lot to speak about when we come to the Masons and so on and so forth. Obviously, I don't want to push it too far because speaking about that, society can have you shut down in a flash. So it's important we don't go there. As you can see, John's holding a book up there called HM, HM Prison Manchester Prison Officer, and it's written by John G. Sutton. So that's your interview today. You've got me, you've got Sean, and you've got John. We started off in his early years where he was working in the cotton mills. We've moved on to where he was in the military, became a champion boxer in the military, continued away from the military, he then went into working in the prison service, and that's where we're at now. I've just asked him where he left the prison service, and it was 1985. He was speaking about being physically assaulted by other prison staff, and he's going to be touching on that, and that's where we're at at the moment. Anyone that's locked in for this live feed that he didn't know about, he appreciate having us all in. It's the Real Crime, Real Time podcast. Sit back and enjoy what, if you can. So go on, John. Sorry about that, mate. Hang on, Sean, have you got any questions there you want to ask? No, I just want to say that, you know, John, he's halfway through a story here and the whole thing is in his, his book that he's got out now. It's available worldwide on Amazon. There's so many more stories in it. But, yeah, this, this story that John's talking about right now, it, it leads to him getting attacked and set up to be killed by the Masons in the, in the prison service. Yeah, that's it. They, they, what they did was they sent a gang round to the quarters where I lived and they uh, attacked me on, on the edge of my quarters. And then well, they fought. Don't gang round, don't they? It doesn't matter if you're an inmate or I'm, I'm, I'm realising now a member of their own clique. When they come in, they're coming in manhandled, aren't they? They came in, there was three of them came at me, yeah. And they followed me to a public house. I mean, I didn't... Uh, uh, intent to get involved in this. I was intent on just going for a quiet afternoon drink after a day at the Scrubs with one of my colleagues. And the three of them followed me into a pub and they came in with glasses in their hand, shouting, right, Sutton, we're going to kill you now. And it, 
I am fairly adept at defending myself, which I then had to do. And when the ambulance took them away, the police came and arrested me. They said I'd used undue force. Well, what is reasonable force when three six foot two inch guys, great big fellas, coming at you with glasses saying they're going to kill you? What do you do? What would you do? Got to defend yourself. And would you be in a? Would you be a, like a champion boxer in the military? You must have been able quite easily to wobble a few chins. No, I just nutted the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it, you, you go on and you go on about the uh, masons and the, the 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 strength of the masons within the establishment. And we're, none of us are stupid here. We all realise how how far and wide the mason the mason society stretches, and in all public arenas of employment, they're in every level, aren't they? You can go right to the top, can't you? The thing is, I mean, about the Masons, I mean, there are certain le there's a certain level of Masons where they, they're just practically the, the foot soldiers. You know, they're just making up the numbers. But the, the 33rd degree Masons, people like Jimmy Savile, people like uh, Lord Mountbatten, they're, they're the people who are pulling the strings. They're the people with real power. People like the judges who are Freemasons, people like senior police officers who are Freemasons. You'll not get through them, believe me, because you come to a certain point, and if if you're one of the one of the one of the one of the team, then if you need help, you will get help. They take an oath that they will defend their fellow Masons against everything. And believe me, that oath, they follow that oath. And and if you try and cross them, you try and get the other side of them. All hell breaks loose. You'd be surprised where it comes from. Well, you People know, back, back in them days, John, I, I believe, I believe the, the the Masons were more. They liked to portray themselves as Lord abiding, you know, citizens, didn't they? You didn't really have any legit criminals within the infrastructure of the Masons, did you? Whereas now, I'm aware of individuals in, who's been around me who's participated in huge drug smuggling, who participated in transfer of firearms, and then firearms are being used in murders. They, they are now in the Masons. So does that, does that mean the Masons have always been criminal? Or, or in the last decade, have they decided to start branching out into the criminal networks in the country? Well, I mean, the, basically, it's being used for ex for personal purposes, really, isn't it? I'll tell you a little story here. My father was a detective inspector, as I've previously told you, and his friend was a chief inspector. And he and his and I knew his friend, he was a nice guy. And he said to me, Dad, listen, if you want to go all the way, he said, you'll join the Masons. He said, now I'll get you in because I'm a Mason. So my dad, who was a practicing Roman Catholic, went to see the priest. Uh, his, his Catholic priest, the Catholic priest said, it, "It's against the teachings of the Catholic Church. You know, I can't accept that you should become a member of the Free, free Masonic movement." So my father didn't join. Uh, his, his friend, who was a chief inspector at the time, went on to become a chief constable. Now, I'm not saying that he wouldn't have made it anyway, but he certainly had a very swift passage from being a uh, practically uh, a, a, what is your beat sergeant in Nelson, yeah, which is a town in Cole, near near Lancashire, yeah, to being the a chief, a chief superintendent, to being a, a chief constable. It was all very rapid, you know. But I mean, that's the Masons for you. They open the doors, and if yeah, you're yeah. not if you're not got the key, if you've not got the key, you're not getting in. That's the power they've got. And as I said earlier on, it's very evident now that they've branched out into the criminal organised crime groups within, especially in Liverpool. He is now a Freemason. You know, there's pictures out of him being awarded as whatever whatever he's in. And when we were children, the majority of the drugs that we'd get given to us or when we were teenagers, young adults, when we were participating in organised crime, the majority of the firearms and the drugs in our area was coming from this type of individual. And then I get out of prison 20 years later and all of a sudden, he that was handing firearms down to us and people were getting killed with firearms is sitting 
within the Mason society now. So that's why I say it's it's like a criminal organization now, isn't it? It's not well, it's yeah, beyond me. I mean, I only know what I know about the Masons, and they were in positions of authority. You didn't get through them. They were they were holding things like the governor would be a Mason. Norman Brown would be a Mason, all the lot of them, the chief officer. And if you weren't one of them, then you were out. You were excluded. There was no way you were going anywhere. And you were just basically cannon fodder. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of people out there now, um, cannon fodder, if you like, who proclaim to be Masons, but they're not really getting to where they expect to be going. You know, you've got podcasters that are attached to Freemasonry. You've got people... As you say, prison officers, you've got cattle fodder Freemasonry, haven't you? But as you said, that 33 degree masonry, they're basically in most of the powerful positions of employment and regimes around the country, aren't they, if not around the world? Certainly uh, in the UK, I mean, the, the Masonic movement is, is a big, big issue. And uh, in Canada, one of my cousins is a member of the a, a leading member of the Masons, but he don't speak to me. <laughs> don't speak to me about it at all. In fact, doesn't speak to me at all. Well, that's what I mean. You're not allowed to speak about that stuff either if you're that high up. It's like when you think about criminals such as and people like this. You know, how was he able to do what he'd done and continue to get free and you know? murder policemen in his back garden and continue to live that life. Anyone that was associated to him, like the, um, that fella that ki killed last Steve Lawrence in London years ago, it, 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 there's meant to be firm belief that because he was linked, to, he was able to evade justice. What's your opinion on that? I believe that that's absolutely the case. I mean, look at Jimmy Savile. I mean, he was a 33rd degree Mason and nobody could touch him. Sir Keir Starmer was the director of public prosecutions at the time, and apparently he had over 20 complaints about Jimmy Savile on his desk. The question should be asked, is Sir Keith Starmer a Mason? Right, and is, is he the one that's the head of the Labour movement right now, trying to become the next Prime Minister? Absolutely. So do you, think, do, you think the do you think the government is um, awash with Freemasonry then? Well, it absolutely is, all the way through. All the major important posts are being held by people who are connected to the Masonic movement. It, it's a corrupt society, and the whole thing is going to collapse because people just won't accept it in the end. Well, that's what I was saying earlier on. Like, back in the day, people used to think as the, the Masonic movement as, you know, law-abiding public figures with power. But here we are now, if, if people are suggesting that that Keir Starmer is a part of that Masonic movement, and I know that criminals from within the city of Liverpool, organised hierarchy criminals, and now within that movement, does that not make it all a little bit messed up if you've got, if you've got notorious gangsters now mixing with people possibly becoming prime ministers of the country? Is it not? Does it not make it a criminal organisation? Well, hasn't it always been the same? I mean, look back at the Cray Twins. One of their big protectors was Lord Boothby. I mean, you've only got to look. And go on to YouTube and have a type in the peer, at the peer and uh, the Cray Twins. Boothby was uh, mixed up with that, and he was absolutely a 33rd degree Mason, and he would be protecting the Cray Twins until they got to the point where they went completely around the bend and started shooting people in public. And that's what will happen. They say, don't they, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. That's where we are. Well, do you think that's why back in the day you had the Crays mixing with the, like, the Barbara Windsors and all these celebrities at the time? Do you reckon some of them celebrities was part of that movement early on? Well, I mean, Barbara Windsor was... Is there such a thing as female Freemasonry or is it just male-dominated? We no, just I, had two I, females on, but it's, it's a different chapter. It's like it's an offspring of the Masons. Is it not attached to the, the main organisation or is it just someone, a female, just started their own Freemason movement? No, it, it's, it's attached. It goes back to the last century, early last century, and it's all the similar rules, but it's like for the women. 
it's mad isn't it it's crazy how society is controlled by these individuals what's annoying to me is what i keep on bringing back into the conversation the fact that i know of criminals that have smuggled huge amounts of drugs into this country distributed firearms in my local area then firearms have went on to be used in murders What's fascinating to me is how these type of individuals are being embraced within the society of Freemasonry. And that's why I want to come back to keep on saying, is it not now a criminal organisation? And if it is a criminal organisation, why hasn't it been targeted the way any other criminal organisation would be? You would, you would like to think so, wouldn't you? But don't forget, there's a big factor here. It's called money. Yeah. And and the drugs are generating millions and millions of pounds. That is my belief why drugs are illegal. So that people can make money out of it. People like Al Capone made a fortune out of beer. I mean, today, I mean, beer, you can go and buy it. It's only six, eight pound a pint. <laughs> How crazy is that? Yeah. What's your, what's, your, what's your idea on drugs then? Would you would you think it would be better for society if they were all legalised or are you happy with them being illegal? I believe there's no kudos in going into Boots with a prescription from the doctor for for about 20 wraps of cocaine or whatever. I, I don't think there's any kudos in that. It's not cool. I mean, the thing is, by making it criminal, they're making it enhanced. It's a thing that you can't get hold of. If you could just go into the chemist and uh, sign a script yourself and purchase it over the counter, it would soon stop. But there would be no profit in it for the government. And I believe that the government are behind this. Certainly in America, you're going to look at, at Pablo Escobar and all that. I mean, you've done, di you've done interviews on this. He was being facilitated by, by the American government to smuggle his stuff into, was it Miami, I think, where it started off? Yeah. So, Sean, what, what's your opinion then, mate? What would what what do you reckon on on the Masonic fraternity? What's your honest opinion about them? Do you think it's a criminal organisation now, or do you think there's just a few bad apples being embraced and let into there through a loophole? Right, so I've just I've just put some links in the live chat about the free male Masons. They're called the Gala Sisters. And they have their own YouTube channel, actually. So I put it, they're, they're part of the Eastern Star Masonic Lodge in Minnesota. So if people want to see what the females are like, it's right there. So I've got, there. Yeah, so I've, I've just got a new book out. It's called Elite Predators from Jimmy Savile and Lord Mountbatten to Epstein and Maxwell. And like John said, Savile, Mountbatten. I mean, how does a DJ from the North get access to the highest levels of the royal family without background checks and everything else, all these complaints coming in about him across the country. He's got it shut down because he's doing the Freemasonic weekly lunches for the cops up in Leeds. And any complaint that comes in, it, it goes to the same cop. So he shuts it down. And then Princess Di, and this is what Netflix didn't show on the recent episode of The Crown. They showed that um, John Major was the marriage guidance mediator. What it didn't show was Jimmy Savile was the bloody marriage guidance mediator between Prince Charles and Diana because it was all, you know, he was elevated to the highest levels of royal access. That's crazy, that. Well, I've seen in documentaries that he had a key to Broadmoor and he can go in there and view who he wanted when he wanted. He had he had keys to all these establishments and he just had free freelance movements in the mall, didn't he? And when the women, when the the, the women he assaulted, uh, hospital victims, females, young females, said to the nurses, "This is what Jimmy did to me in the night." The nurses would say, "It was just Jimmy. There's nothing we could do about it. Just don't tell anyone." What about Roth Harris? I don't know much about his story. We have interviewed a few people on it, but I'm not. I'm not sure. I know a lot about. Well, Roth Harris was. Was that powerful enough to sit in front of the Queen and do a piece of art on it, Wayne? And then it all came out a few years later that he was similar to Savile, Wayne? I don't think he was as prolific, but the crimes were equally evil and insidious. So there's a lot of there's a lot of um, madness going on in the in the world, and for for some reason we've been blind to it for a long, long time. But all of a sudden, 
the amount of information that you can get access to is starting to make people see sense about certain things, isn't it? It seems to me. I mean, I get a lot of comments from people who have served in the prison service. And they say things like, I've done 30 years in the prisons. I never saw anything like you've seen. Well, open your eyes. I've, I mean, I've, been, I've, I've been in prison the majority of my life, and I've, I've witnessed young boys being abused in Wellington House when I was 15. You know, we can go into we can go into Woodhill in 2011 when I was there. That's a Category A prison. You, what the what the what the the law changed so years ago. You could only have 16 to 18 in one prison, then 18 yeah. to 21 in another, then 21 and over in another. All of a sudden, that got relaxed, and you could have 18 year olds in with the cons. And yeah. when that happens. I witnessed one young lad getting gang raped. I never watched it, but you've seen the men go in. You've seen the shit. you heard the stuff go on. You've seen them come out. You see the wing get locked down. You see them getting removed into segregation. But there was nothing in the papers that that young lad had been gang raped in Woodhill in 2011. Absolutely not. And they brushed it under the carpet. They would do, but uh, I was at Strange Ways, and one of your big drug smugglers, who I will not mention by name, uh, well, a big drug dealer from Liverpool was in Strangeways when I was there, and he found him. I found him. He was at age of about thirty-five at the time, and he was on the, the YP wing, and the YPs were up to the age of twenty-one. But it was under the, it was the rules. The nineteen fifty-three Prison Act required that there was segregation between adults and junior prisoners, and he was the, the red band on the YP wing. So I said to him, "Get your gear packed. You're moving out." Oh no, I said. The, Principal officer, such a body has appointed me as the cleaner on here. I said, "Well, I'll I'll deal with him when I finish dealing with you." Now get your gear packed, and I moved him off the YP wing onto the adult wing, and then I went to see the the, the principal officer, and I told him what I'd done. He said, "You've got no authority to do that." I said, "Well, you can't change the 1953 Prison Act, but if you insist on attempting to do so, you can explain it to the governor because I'm about to put a paper in about this." which I did, but I'd moved him then and it was too late, you know, so that I put a stop to that, but I'm not going to sit back and watch some 35 year old, just because he's a multi-millionaire drug dealer buggering you bloody YPs. Why won't you name him? Why won't I name him? He's alive. So what? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a good it'll be reason. Nice to know, you know, it'll be nice to know that within the city, in within the city of Liverpool, you've got a that has been abusing kids. You know who his name. You don't need me to tell you who his name is. There's only one we can refer to, but he weren't no big drug smuggler. <laughs> and it'll be Mr. Purple, wouldn't it? But you never know. I didn't know calling him Mr. Purple, but anyway, yeah. it's immaterial what his name was. That happened, yeah. Yeah. And the worst thing happened than that, I tell you. Talk about the Masons. I was in the, the the segregation unit at Wormwood Scrubs. It'd be 1976. And uh, it was lunchtime, and it was locked down. The prison always locked down at lunchtime. And uh, the senior officer in charge of the unit came to me and said, we've got a special guest coming in, a special visitor. He said, you will not go anywhere near him. You will not recognise him. You will not witness what takes place. He said, you'll stand at the other side of the way. And this guy came in, a great big guy, immaculately dressed, well, a thousand pound suit, you know, all the lot. And they took him in and they put him into the cell uh, with this uh, sex offender, Ian Brady. Yeah. And he was in there for about 20 minutes. When he went in, he was immaculate. When he came out, his shirt was undone. His tie was over one side. His face was all red. He was swell. What the bloody hell been up to? Yeah. I know. Well, two things, it? it was either giving him a hiding for what he'd been up to or. He was having his wicked little way with him. I think he was buggering him, to be honest. Oh, it's messy. It's absolutely crazy, mate. And, but they swore isn't me. It's it? it scary to think what goes on behind closed doors. And, and when, when, even now, just because it's more human rights and such and all this, you know, you've got thousands of young lads, thousands of young kids in the prenal system. And some of them do get abused. I, I think there's been cases that's been released to the public as far back as 1998 or something, where there was young men in prisons down south being abused by prison officers. 
it's a known fact that to, to suggest it doesn't happen is just madness. It's horrible. It's just ridiculous. I mean, I was on nights one night at, uh, in the Boston allocation unit at Strangeways. I don't know if they had Boston now, do they? But they had a Boston allocation unit there. And uh, the one of the officers in charge said, John, come with me. I said, what is it? He said, I want you to watch this. I said, oh, tell me what I'm going to watch. He said, all these lads in, in, in this cell here, they're wanking away. I said, I've got better things to do than that, you know. <laughs> hey. Going around, going around all night, curving into people's cells. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. I've I've seen that on the out. You know, I've been I've been seventeen years old, and we I used to have this friend called Peter Allman. He ended up going on his toes because he snitched on a murderer. So we ended up living in Spain. But before he went on his toes, there used to be a woman that lived next door to him called Snatch. Pat her name was. It was a huge woman, and she had tattoos all up her arms and all this stuff. And the lower echelons of the Farley's fame, like Young Alan, Marvin, all these individuals, they used to go into this snatcher's house, and they'd all be masturbating to porn, like six or seven of them. I've, I've come out of Peter's, gone in, went into the living room, and they're all just there, so what the, what the fuck's going on here? And bailed, but, you know, it happens. I don't know what it is. It's just sick, isn't it? It's a strange world. It's, 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 the things that we're becoming aware to now is just absolutely horrendous. And it makes it more important to watch out for the youth and the children because they're the ones that are most at harm here, aren't they? Well, yeah. It is, but you see, the thing is, I get lots of prison officers saying to me, well, I never saw anything like that. What were they doing? I mean, you've been... John, in- John what, what about the time you fell asleep on duty and a gangster was trying to French kiss you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that that was it. Silver, his name was. He was a uh, he was the former head of uh, Soho Vice team. You know, he was a, a vice man. He ran the vice clubs in Soho. Uh, Bernie Silver and I was uh, in charge of the hospital ward one night at the Scrubs, and uh, I fell asleep and I woke up. It'd be about half two in the morning, and Bernie Silver had sat on my knee with his arm put his arm around me, trying to. Stick his tongue down my throat. Oh, I love you. I love you. God help me. I never fell asleep again. I tell you, no, I that. And that was his way of corrupting you. No, I don't know. I think he was mad. He was suffering from uh, uh, the final stages of syphilis. Yeah. Did you not? Did you not consider just you know going all out and having a power neck with him? <laughs> <laughs> I can think of a response to that, but it's not appropriate. When I was on the hour now, obviously your story's intriguing. It's it's been fascinating to listen to. You've got yourself a book out, haven't you, Lyle? Would you like to tell us a bit about your book? Yeah, well, it's very kind of been published by Sean Atwood's company, Gadfly Publishing, and uh, it's HMP Manchester Prison Officer. It's available on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Well, I would, wouldn't I? I wrote it. Is yeah, that a picture of you on the front? Yes, that's a picture of me as a young man. You really are, fucking in your, in your black and white. Well, I was a young man then, wasn't I? I was 27, I think. I've got a head yeah. on you, John. Fucking hell, mate. You must, how, big, how tall are you, John? Are you tall or are you small? No, I'm only, I was five foot eight. I've shrunk a bit now, but I was never big. I was obviously big enough. Was you thick? Was you like... Well, I'm 15 stone. Yeah, so that's quite big, isn't it? Big enough. I mean, Mike Tyson's only five foot nine, isn't he? Yeah, that's what I mean. If you're 15 stone and around that, that height, you're sort of wide and thick, aren't you? Whereas if you were taller, you'd be a little lean. Yeah. There. So you must if, you're that, if, you're that, if you're that size, you don't go down very easily. You know, I never... But anyway, I didn't go in there to batter him, mates. So I went in there for a job. I was trying to look after my wife. I've got a handicapped child. I had to look after my child. You know, I wasn't going in there to to be a hero. I was going in there to earn a living. That's what I did it for. And all I got was abuse, the bastards. <laughs> so where you are, John, What in, in what some people might say your twilight years, you're in your 70s. <laughs> what, 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 <laughs> yeah. what advice would you give to anyone? Is there any, is the one, you know, is the one, Bit of advice that you think people should practice? 
Yeah, absolutely don't give a shit, lad. If you're going if you're going out there, do what you think's right and don't let anybody tell you you're wrong. If you know you're right, stick with it. And to your own self, be absolutely true. And that's yeah. the way I've gone through life. Be true to oneself. It's like don't lose your identity in it. Always identify who you are and where you've come from. Do not give in. Well, John, it's been pleasant. It's nice to have you on. It's been, as I said, it's been very fascinating your life at the moment. It's we couldn't we couldn't sit here for hours and do it properly. We got to bastardize it into a shorter version. People, if you need to know more about it, Sean's holding the book up there now for you. He's going to let you if you want to know more about John G. Sutton's life as a as a way a young man from Lancashire, where started work in the in the cotton mills, moved on to the military, left the military, ended up into the prison system. He's come out of the prison system and, and here he is. He's doing what he's doing. It's been a fascinating talk for me and I hope my people have liked it. Oh, out, John. Have you got any last words, friend? Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Darren. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, John. John. Cheers. Speak to you soon, brother. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. What do you say, Sean? Sean is a no-nonsense guy. He's got his military training. He's got his boxing training. And in the book, if anyone causes any shit, and a lot of people do cause shit, he just knocks them out or they do get hospitalised. And I just like the way he just says everything as it is. There's no bullshit. He's always honest. He's never tempted into corruption or stealing anything. And he, he is a true hero because all around him was corruption and, and madness. Well, he did. He did go in deep with a few, you know, um, homosexual shouts in the sense of, "Is my channel safe if I upload this content? Will my channel get hurt in any way by the content that's just come out there?" No, I don't believe it will. You could always do an edited version and re-upload it if you're worried. No, I don't really. And... I don't really like editing stuff, especially when it's frank and. On points, that's that's what I love about people. People aren't scared to hold back. Obviously, he held back on the name of the gangster that was abusing kids in prison, but it is what it is. He's got his ways. He doesn't want to become harmed in any way. So I was about to say, the more you name people, those people named can then contact and you know, yeah, get defaminate and um, intimidate and so on and so forth. But what what a guy he is up front. No fucks given, saying what he believed, and that's what I love in people. He's and unique, to, be in, isn't he? to, be, to be in his seventies and still have the capacity to think straight is magnificent, isn't it, Lar? He but is John, unique. Have you got any last words, Sean? Obviously, thanks once again for joining me on a live feed and giving the people something to watch and think about. It's very thought provoking. There's been a lot of stuff there that they may find hard to believe. You know, it is what it is. There's a lot of stuff that people just won't believe full stop. But I think we touched on a lot of things that people weren't aware about. I was one of them on some of them. So it is what it is. We're going to keep it real. Any last words, Sean? Yeah, who do you want on next? Because we've interviewed almost a 1,000 people on my channel and we've just got loads. So you just let me know. And you make my life easy, Darren. I just sit here and listen. I don't have to ask any questions. It's great. <laughs> We've got different interviewing skills, and you're, you're in the game for a long time. You, you, you're well rehearsed in interviewing. I'm not. I've got a different way of approaching questions and asking people about their lives. The way yours is more the way you do it. So it's going to be appetising to the viewers, isn't it? You know, it's going you to be. You bring out. You bring out a completely different side of them than they've already told on my channel. So it's creating new stories and new content. I yes. think people like it. It's just under an hour. It's punchy. And it's, yeah, it's a buzz. All right, then. Well, you mentioned there any more people. I'll I'll interview anyone. And it doesn't have to be a stream. Uh, they can be in studios. I know you mentioned the other day. I know you don't like going places. I'll go anywhere as long as the individuals are where they're going for. You know what I mean? Yeah, but these are, these, these, are, these are dead easy. Let's ask the viewers. Put a one in the chat if you want us to start doing these, you know, every week or so, just an hour long, bringing a new guest in with Darren so and me. All, 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 uh, all my people in, in here and Sean's people, I'm sure a few of you have logged in as well. 
if you want us to continue on a weekly basis, you know, revolving weekly interviews with different people on StreamYard, hit a number one. If you'd rather see me and Sean present with some individuals, hit a number two. Let's see what's going on. It's looking like the one, Sean. Yeah, I, could, I might be able to arrange someone for lunch tomorrow, actually. We'll do that then, mates. I'm free. I'm, I'm ready to go. All right, I'll put the feelers out. I'll speak, to you, I'll, speak, I'll speak to you off the live in a minute, mate. Hope you're well. It's been, as again, it's been good. It's been exciting. I'd just like to repeat a thank you to John G. Sutton for participating in this live feed this afternoon. Peace out till five. Shouts, choose a life, not a knife. As always, people, protect the children, protect the future. Keep it real. Cheers, everyone. Thanks.